My name is um, Dr. Andrew Fisher. I am now an assistant professor at the University of Chicago in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Uh, I'm a trained OBGYN. I've been in practice now for six years um, following residency. Uh, I also serve as the medical director for our transgender care program here at the University of Chicago. Um, and CARE is an acronym actually, so it stands for uh, the Clinic for Affirmation and Reproductive Equity. Um, so our mission is to provide holistic uh, gender affirming care to our trans and gender diverse patients. There are some really basic things that anybody who's kind of open minded and well intentioned um, and honest with themselves can do. You know, there are of course things we talk about all the time and we see more commonly now in the clinical setting. Um, such as using a patient's chosen name or pronouns. Um, and that's often just a, an easy way to signal to a patient that you are trying to be an affirming provider and create a space that's safe for them. But it's also goes a long way to outwardly verbalize that to a patient um, and be honest with them. And say to a patient, I wanna do my very best to take care of all of your needs you know, if there are things that come up that I don't have answers for, I'll make an effort um, to get those answers for you. Um, and if I say anything incorrectly, or if I accidentally offend you in some way, please let me know um, so that I can correct that for now and in the future. Um, patients don't expect us to have all of the answers all the time, but if they know that you're on their side and in their court and willing to, you know, work with them and fight for them, uh, that goes a long way because there's not many clinicians out there still who, um, or, or at least clinicians that they've interacted with, who may want to um, do that for them. I try not to put too much on the patient. There's a long history of uh, mistreatment, as unintentional as it may have been that's occurred in the past between, you know, that the healthcare organization as, uh, as a whole um, and patients. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have shown that anywhere from a quarter to a third of trans and gender diverse patients have been mistreated by healthcare professionals in some way in the past. Um, a lot of times that could be something as simple as using incorrectly or unintentionally or even intentionally the wrong name or pronouns or restricting care or not being offered certain um, therapies or alternatives um, as a result of their transness or gender diversity. Um, and so it's really difficult for a patient to walk in the door. And that's sometimes the first thing I acknowledge with a patient is to say, hey, I'm glad you're here. You know, thank you for being here. Just acknowledge the, the hurdles um, that they had to overcome just by showing up in the office. Um, and so given that, context it's it's a lot then for a patient to then be thinking about how do i now advocate for myself how do i communicate what my symptoms are and what my needs are and advocate for the treatments that i need that burden should really fall on us as clinicians i feel like um but there are a number of things that we as clinicians should remember to do that patients can be made aware of um, that so that if they want to advocate for a little more of a comfortable space um, for them to be seen in that they can do. For example, uh, a lot of times, you know, we'll reflexively ask the patient to undress before coming into the office. And if a patient's asked to do that, they might simply request that they remain dressed, you know, until they meet the clinician. Uh, that may be more uncommon um, these days, but it can still occur in a lot of contexts. Um, the other thing is that there are many terms we use in medicine that we don't think twice about, but can actually be quite offensive um, or distressing for patients. For example, if you have a trans patient um, assigned female at birth who identifies as a trans man, um, but doesn't identify with the idea of having a vagina or having a uterus or having an ovaries, sometimes it's more comfortable for them to use their own terms. 
to refer to those organs when, when needed. Um, and so we as clinicians can ask this, but patients can also say, is it all right if we use some alternative terms for some of the body parts that we might talk about today? And they can offer up what those terms are. Um, and that's an easy way just to help a patient feel more relaxed. Of course, there's times where we have to be very specific about what organs we're talking about or what organs we plan to examine. Um, and in those situations, we can kind of use both terms, the medical term and the um, preferred, more comfortable term to communicate um, what hurts them, uh, what symptoms they have, uh, and, and what kind of plans or next steps we might have to do. I think what's, what's interesting about this concept of menopause and the trans population is, is that we don't really know what that term means anymore. You know, we think about what is menopause. It's, it's, it's that period in a cis woman's life where, you know, the, horm the, the ovaries start to produce less estrogen and they start to experience hormonal side effects from that process. This whole idea of what is hormonally normal um, in a trans person goes completely out the window. You know, we're talking about people who may have had ovaries suppressed as a result of testosterone use from a very early time in their life. Usually, you know, some trans men can go on hormone therapy as early as 16 or 18 years old. It doesn't take long after starting testosterone for the ovaries to become fully suppressed because uh, testosterone is a very potent hormonal agent. So, you know, these people have effectively gone through some amount of at least estrogen based, you know, menopause um, since a very early time in their life. Um, the symptoms they may experience in their progression through that initial phase is quite different because what we know is that a little bit of the testosterone that they use actually can become aromatized or converted to estrogen. So there may be some, you know, mitigation of those kind of natural symptoms that we associate with menopause. Um, that can occur with testosterone. Um, so um, that's a big piece of it. And the other piece is that these individuals are kind of living and functioning in social circles where not many other people are going through what they're going through. So I know that for my cisgendered patients who come in with various symptoms of menopause, vasomotor symptoms, you know, vaginal dryness, all these things, a lot of what they bring into the office is context that they've heard or learned from other friends or family members who've gone through that process before. And I think that experience that they have um, with those personal contexts helps those individuals frame and contextualize what they want to say to a physician. Uh, many of our patients don't have those same contexts. They may read on or see things on social media or whatnot, but they don't even have the same you know, vocabulary, if you will. Um, to be able to describe what they're going through when they come into the office. And so as a clinician, we have to be a little bit alert that maybe some of the things that they're feeling could be related to this hormonal process, even though they may not be able to necessarily associate it with that. Um, I'll give you some examples. For one, mood lability or worsening depressive or anxiety symptoms um, can be a part of that. Um, so. It's not uncommon for many of our patients to also struggle with depression or anxiety or any other number of mental health conditions, but we have to keep in mind that there may be some changes in the severity of those conditions um, when we're starting testosterone or when we're, you know, at, they may have undergone surgery to have the ovaries removed. How much of that is related to the hormonal process of removing any endogenous estrogen that they have left versus, you know, what may be due to just their hormone therapy or are the things going on in their life it can be really difficult to sort out but i think just being aware that hey maybe this sort of you know unique menopausal process may be contributing to what a lot of what this patient's talking about and going through well let's assume that a patient does have the vocabulary and does have the context to be able to talk about what they're feeling and what they're experiencing. And let's even say we as clinicians have the tools to be able to recognize, you know, what is what our patients is going through. 
the next challenge is that we don't have any data on what to do with that information. You know, we don't know what the long-term health risks are for trans men or trans masculine individuals who go through, you know, ovarian suppression at a young age or ovarian removal and now all of a sudden have very low levels of endogenous estrogen. Again, there may be some protective benefit of testosterone, but we don't know what the impact of that benefit is or if it really even is a benefit. Um, we don't know what their long-term cardiovascular health risks look like and their long-term bone health risks look like. Um, and so it makes it very difficult when we try to guide them and it impacts our counseling on, on when we decide to offer a patient hormone therapy or offer a patient to surgery. Uh, there's so many unknowns. We try to extrapolate data that we've learned from um, cis women and from the Women's Health Initiative. Um, but there are some unique differences. This is generally a younger population than a lot of the data that we have out there describes. And it's also a population that for the most part is maintained on some kind of hormone therapy, testosterone therapy. So, you know, so there are a lot of unknowns there. Uh, the other piece of it is that when we think about common treatments for menopausal symptoms, our mind immediately goes to hormone replacement therapy and estrogen therapy. And as one could imagine, recommending estrogen or a feminizing hormone to a patient who identifies as masculine is not going to be an easy or productive conversation generally. Um, and so we almost have fewer options as far as treatments for these things. Um, maybe things will evolve. Maybe we'll be able to find uh, other treatments that develop over time as these new potential health risks arise. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns. And, and um, as a clinician, the challenge is making sure that we appropriately inform patient of those unknown risks. Not just say, we don't know what's going to happen, but go so far as to say, listen, there may be an increased risk of heart disease or stroke, there may be an increased risk of bone loss at an early age. Um, but we also have to address the risks in front of us and the, and the risks of severely worsening mental health um, to a trans patient who isn't able to receive the hormone therapy um, or the surgical treatments that they need. Um, so sometimes we say doing nothing is also harm. And so we have to factor that all that in and, and bring the patient into that conversation. So um, my research is going to be looking more at, you know, what understanding those experiences of transmasculine individuals as they go through those um, critical hormonal changes and processes and steps in their lifetime uh, and understanding what those long-term health implications are um, for the various treatments that we offer um, this very special population. None of us have all the answers. We're using best judgment, but it really is, and we never want to rely on our patients to have to educate us on, you know, who they are, what they're going through. But, uh, but we do value that when patients are willing to share details about their lives um, because it really does help us work together with patients to formulate a, a plan, um, something that really optimizes what their own healthcare goals are. And um, the more they are able to share with us, the better. But again, it's our responsibility to make sure that that environment is there. Um, we can't expect a patient to share intimate details of the light of their life with us if we can't even use the name and pronouns correctly. Um, so, you know, it's um, a lot of the, the burden is still on us. And that's why we try to, to educate our, our colleagues as much as we can and, and learn for ourselves as much as we can as time goes on. Um, but to patients, I would simply say, you know, we really value the trust that you place in clinicians and us when um, we're there to take care of her because for, by and far, the vast majority of us just wanted to do the right thing and to try to take better care of you. Um, and we don't take that responsibility lightly. Um, so, so I really appreciate when patients feel comfortable enough to share personal details of their life with me because um, that always make me a better person and, and a better physician.